There we go. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Is it Sheila? She's still connecting. Shella? Looks like Shella? Shella. Shella. That's a cool name. Well, I'm going to be letting people in as we go along, but I'm going to go ahead and get started for the sake of time because I know everyone's time is so valuable. Um, my name is Donna and I am with Down Syndrome Association for Families here in Nebraska. I am um, their education advocacy uh, person and their program coordinator. And uh, tonight we have Jessica Cuss with us from NDSS, National Down Syndrome Society. And she is here to talk to us about um, inclusion and the IEP and some of the things that we have to um, remember or some of the things that we should remember or should include when we're holding our meetings um, and getting ready to um, give our, our best of ourselves to our school districts. So I wanna welcome her and thank her for being here today. If you have any questions, she's going to take some questions at the end, but you can go ahead and put them in the chat as well. Um, and then she will probably peruse her website a little bit um, and we will get going here. Let me give you permission to share your screen. I'm sure you probably wanna do that. You should be able to share it now. And this is Jessica. Okay, yes, I do. <laughs> Welcome Jessica. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here and I um, hope you find the information um, valuable and like, um, Donna said, please feel free to put questions in the chat or if you need to stop me somewhere, just type that in the chat and I'm more than happy um, to answer questions as we go or at the end. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen, let's see. Um, does that work? Can you guys see it? Okay, okay. All right, so basically, we're, I'm from the National Down Syndrome Society. Um, I'm here to talk about inclusive education and how it relates to the IEP. Um, the National Down Syndrome Society, who we are, is we are the leading human rights organization for all individuals with Down syndrome. Um, NDSS envisions a world in which all people with Down syndrome have the opportunity to enhance their quality of life and realize their life aspirations and become valued members of welcoming communities. We were founded in 1979 by um, Betsy Goodwin and her family. Um, Betsy is still an active part of our board and her daughter Carson is 41 now since we celebrated our 40th anniversary last year. And Carson is also one of our staff members who works out of our New York City office. Um, however, right now, no one's in the office. We're at, um, all working remotely. So um, that's been hard for some of our self-advocate employees, especially because they miss coming in and we miss seeing them all. So hopefully that will end soon and we will all be able to get back to some sort of normalcy. Um, so as far as programming goes with NDSS, we break it down into three larger areas, resources and support, policy and advocacy, and community engagement. And so really education kind of falls under all of those because we want to provide resources and support to our families. We are very active at the state and federal level um, advocating for people with Down syndrome across the board, not just with education, but especially with education and inclusion and then community engagement with just doing things like this and, and getting involved um, and helping our local affiliates serve their families um, as best as they can. So a little bit about me. Um, I actually grew up with um, a person, a girl my age with Down syndrome, my mom's best friend from high school had a daughter who was born a few months after me, and she was born with Down syndrome. And so I grew up around my friend, Laura. Um, we didn't live in the same state, but we got together regularly. And she inspired me to want to become a special ed teacher through high school. I was active at Easter Seals and Special Olympics. And I just really, you know, felt that that was kind of where I should be. Um, so I went to school, I went to James Madison, 
um, where I got my undergrad and graduate degree in special education. Um, I started teaching in Northern Virginia in Fairfax County. And when I got pregnant with my daughter, who is almost 10, I took a break from teaching uh, to be a stay-at-home mom. Um, and then about two years later, my son Bradley was born. Um, we had a birth diagnosis of Down syndrome, which was shocking, obviously. Um, but it kind of, you know, led me to believe that this is kind of where I'm supposed to be. And, and this is, you know, what my purpose is. So um, after staying home for a few more years, um, I then had an opportunity to come work for NDSS, uh, initially uh, helping with our health and wellness programs. Um, so I've done a lot um, in that space. And um, when we were in between hiring education directors, um, I kind of stepped in um, to act in that role. And we did hire a new director of education, Bart. He started um, in January. Um, and so things are moving along great, um, but I am staying on um, and kind of doing both roles right now um, to continue to support the education program, which is really where my, my passion lies in, in helping families, um, especially you know in the IEP process. I feel like being having been on both sides of the table, um, it's, I'm able to kind of see it from both lenses um, and I hopefully provide uh, valuable information to, to various families as they go into IEP meetings, whether they have, they're contentious or they're not and they're happy. Um, but so that's a little bit about me. Bradley is seven and he is in his second year of kindergarten this year due to COVID, we all felt he needed some extra time in those foundational years. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so tonight I just kind of <laughs> outlined um, where, what we'll talk about, um, why of inclusive education, how the federal law supports it, um, a little bit about our education program and, and where it's going under our new director, um, and how to support families like yourselves in your local group and communities. Um, and so I'll go over some of those researches um, and provide some resources at the end. Um, and so I will, I can also email those links to Donna and she can send them out to you. Um, and I have a list of books that are also very, um, very helpful for parents and as well to provide to your school um, for their professional libraries. Okay, so the history of inclusive education uh, back in 1975, was when Congress passed the Education for All Handicapped Children, which was then reauthorized in 1990 and again in 2004, and is IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education mm -hmm. Act. Um, and this protects the educational rights of students with disabilities, um, although terms of inclusion and inclusive education are not uh, spelled out in the law, uh, the concept of a free and appropriate public education, commonly referred to as FAPE, um, in the least restrictive environment provides the legal basis for creating education based on the principles of inclusion. So there has been a lot of research um, dating back to the 1970s and before on what we know about inclusion. And there have been zero studies to show that anyone has a, di a disadvantage um, when in an inclusive environment. Typically developing children are showing only positive developmental and attitudinal outcomes from inclusive experiences. Um, I think it's very similar to how um, siblings and, and neighbors are with, with children when they're a part of their community from the beginning. Um, they're not seen as different. They're seen as part of part of the class, part of the community, part of their um, social group. So there's also no evidence that children with certain disabilities or levels of impairment are poor candidates for inclusive environments. Um, it's a common misconception that you know if a child cannot keep up or they're too far behind or they have behavior problems that they would do better in a in a segregated setting and that is not the case as far as the research is concerned. Um, it is showing that, you know, 
including our students with their general education peers is proving for the best outcome. And education is a key indicator of success in the workplace, not only for people with disabilities, but without disabilities. And it correlates directly um, to graduation rates and overall quality of life post-graduation. Um, students who were in a segregated environment um, have a, a 79% less chance of being employed than um, a student that was included um, throughout their education. So some of the actual research studies um, show, these are some of the bigger ones, that students made more progress in reading and math when they were included in general education classrooms. Uh, increases in test scores related to increased time spent in general education classrooms. And researchers have noted that students with disabilities can more easily access the curriculum in inclusive classrooms when inclusive practices and strategies are implemented. Um, and the child should not have to earn his way into an integrated school setting by first functioning successfully in segregated settings. Inclusion is a right, not a privilege for a select few, and success in special schools and special classes does not lead to successful functioning in an integrated society, which is clearly one of the goals for IDEA. And this was from a court case um, back in 1993 where a child was uh, being forced to go to a different school, not their home school, and the parents were fighting for their child to go to his home school. Um, and the court found in favor of the parents, stating that, you know, you to be a part of your community is most important um, than having to go to a different school just because that might be where a teacher who is trained uh, in special education might be, um, that that is not a valid excuse for a school system to not provide the least restrictive environment, which includes, you know, being educated at your base school, your home school. Um, some of the post-secondary research um, is, is the key indicator of success, like I mentioned before. Um, and in the fall of 2018 in the study, 36% of students with disabilities were not included in general education classrooms for at least 80% of the day. And that translated into only two thirds of students with disabilities graduating from high school. And people ages 25 and over with less than a high school diploma are less than 20% as likely to hold a job than someone in that same category uh, without a disability. So continuing, with the inclusion in your classroom, it is yielding significant benefits to both students with disabilities and their peers. Um, and students with disabilities who are fully included are about five times more likely to graduate on time as to those compared in, ex compared to those in excluded settings. And a lot of that attributes to access to the general education curriculum. Often when students are placed in a segregated environment, um, the access to the general education curriculum diminishes as the years go on. And more of an alternate curriculum or a modified curriculum or a life skills curriculum is what many school systems try and, and gear those students with more significant disabilities um, in the direction of. So, the education program at NDSS, this is actually a picture of Charlotte Woodward, who is our um, community outreach um, associate. And she, um, I actually know Charlotte outside of work as well. She lives um, in my area in Northern Virginia, and I have served on the board of our local um, Down syndrome organization with Charlotte for five years. Um, and Charlotte, uh, not only is she the first, uh, one of the only individuals with Down syndrome, if not the only, to have received a heart transplant, um, Charlotte has graduated from high school with a standard diploma. She earned her associate's degree from Northern Virginia Community College, and she is currently um, a student at George Mason University majoring in sociology, um, and she is taking about two classes per semester. Um, 
in the general education population. She is not a part of the, the George Mason Life Program, which is a, oops, excuse me, um, a, a program for students with intellectual disabilities, um, which is a great program that they have, but Charlotte is a very determined young woman who has a bright future ahead of her. And she was hoping that she could be on tonight to speak, but she had another um, engagement that she could not um, could not miss. And so I told her that I would share a bit of her story on her behalf. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier in the program, um, we did hire a new director, um, Bart Devon, and he comes to us actually from Autism Speaks. And so he has a lot of experience in the disability space. He was a former teacher as well. Um, and so we are really focusing on these legislative and regulatory efforts at federal and state levels um, and programming for local service providers. And our, and our main goal right now is to develop an online resource library of our own materials and partnering with other organizations that have established um, toolkits and, and resources to make it easier for our families to have access to all of the supports they need and empower them to, you know, feel confident in an IEP meeting and, and have all of the resources um, easily at their fingertips. So with the IEP, parents, you are the expert on your child um, and you are just as much a part of the team as anyone else. Um, and I know a lot of times, just even for me being on both sides, uh, it's as a teacher, it was intimidating when, you know, parents were coming in and then, you know, and I know now as a parent, when you walk in and there's 10 other people sitting around the table and you're one person, um, but you basically are half of that team too, because you know your child best, you know what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, you, you have a vision for your child um, and goals for your child, and you have every right to ensure that the team is on board with that. And so one thing that I strongly um, recommend for parents to do is a parent input and concerns. Usually there's a form, depending on your state, um, that you can fill out or I actually do, um, I send an email and I request that it is just copy and pasted into our IEP. They put it on our plop page, which is the present level of performance, just, you know, the running notes. Um, and we, in that statement, kind of my husband and I say what Bradley is good at, what he's working on, what doesn't work, and where we want, where we see him right now, and hopefully in the future, he will be the one saying his vision, but right now we want him to, you know, look at that end, end game or roadmap, so to speak, of what you want life to look like down the line post-graduation. And what are the steps that you need to take now in education to get your child to that point? You know, do you want them to have meaningful employment? Do they want to go to college? Do they want to be an actor uh, like one of my colleagues, David DeSantis, and, you know, star in a movie? And, and what, are, what does the team need to do to set your child up for success? And so I find that when, I, when we start the meeting with, that clear vision statement of, you know, as early as preschool, that we want Bradley to be independent, a valued member of the community, have a job that he is proud of, and not just a job that will hire him, something that he's enjoying and he wants to do. And in order to do that, he needs to interact with other peers um, in his community. The world is not a segregated place. So when our students graduate, uh, they're not going to be in a special ed <laughs> bubble. Um, and so it's important for everyone um, to see that. And so I, I really encourage parents, whether or not they write it down, or at least to start with it. Um, there's also a template, which I can share. Um, another mom made it up, but it is kind of like a one pager printout with your child's picture. And you can kind of break it down into like strengths, we, not weaknesses, strengths, what you're working on, what you like, what doesn't work. You know, for instance, you know, we say that no, like not enough time for transitions. Like that's important for people to know, like he needs a warning or 
it's not going to work. Um, and he loves Toy Story. So right then and there, that's an automatic reward that they can do is find some Toy Story stickers or play a Buzz Lightyear video on YouTube and he's good. Um, so I think it's important as just as you know, you're know, you part of the team and you want the and the teachers to kind of and the team to, to bring you into that to also share what you know and what works for your child and what is important. Um, as you know, collaboration is really important um, when it comes to the team and the IEP and to really try and work together and not against each other. Um, and so the, you know, when we talk about inclusion, we're saying that we want our children to have access to the general education curriculum. It's not necessarily saying they're going to keep up and that they're gonna remain on grade level and they're gonna do everything that every other child in that classroom is doing. Um, and you want, when you're writing goals, to focus on those grade level gen ed curriculum subjects and what they're working on and how they're gonna integrate. They might have a different math and reading writing goal, but how can they, how can you formulate your goal to reflect what some of those subject areas are that they will be working on. Um, you know, in science and social studies, you can also work on writing in, when you're in science and social studies. When you are in math, you could be working on, you know, tracing your numbers and things like that. Um, so for the team to kind of really sit down and get creative and see how you can make things adaptable across all subjects and then what skills um, and supports does that child need to, to successfully access uh, that curriculum. Um, and I really like this quote by Rita Pearson that every child deserves a champion and an adult who will never give up on them, who understands the power of connection and insists that they become the best they can be. And I really feel like as parents, uh, that's kind of our role is to be our child's champion and especially um, in the younger years um, until they can be a part of the IEP meeting. Um, I think that that is a valuable um, thing to have as your child gets older. My son actually last week, um, his, it wasn't my idea. I wasn't even thinking he's in kindergarten. She said, Bradley's going to start the IEP and tell us what he likes. And so he introduced himself and he said, my name is Bradley. I'm seven. And she had created a Google slide and was like, he's like, I like pizza, Toy Story, and dogs. And then the aide took him out of the room. But, you know, I, and I hadn't even thought about doing something like that at such a young age. You know, obviously, when you think about transition and, you know, middle school and high school, like, usually students are an active part of their IEP. Um, but even just that little bit of, you know, showing who the child is, and it's not just somebody on paper, um, I think really helps set the tone um, of a meeting as well. Okay, so a little bit about some terms, mainstreaming versus inclusion. Some people call it integration. So mainstreaming is really when students from a separate special education class or separate room kind of come in and visit. Um, and so you, it doesn't mean that they're not being a part of the community, but it's usually for a non-academic subject. Maybe they're sitting with them at lunch or coming in for morning meeting. Um, so that's really more just integrating them with it, not true inclusion. Because inclusion is more of a, a philosophy, a process of including everyone um, and that everyone is educated for the majority of the school day to the best extent um, or what is most appropriate for that child. Um, in a general education classroom with the necessary supports. Um, that is, you know, I think a lot of schools uh, don't necessarily see the difference. Um, I think a lot of schools do a lot of mainstreaming and integration and think that they're doing inclusion. Um, and so there's a lot of um, education from you know parents and other professionals that that need to be provided to schools and teachers to kind of help guide them in the direction of true inclusion and what best practices are. So I always like this little graphic because um, it kind of helps visualize what in the least restrictive environment what different settings look like. 
inclusion to me is exclusion. I mean, is when these children are maybe at a completely different school, not just like in another classroom, like they're at a special education school, they're excluded from being a part of anything in their, in their school community. Um, and then integration is when, you know, that group of kids comes in and they might all sit at one table, but they're in the same space. And segregation would be when they are in that classroom down the hall um, with another teacher and everyone else is in the other classroom. So when you look at the diagram of inclusion, all of the different colors, how they're spread out through the class, it's not evident that these are the kids from room 104 that are coming in for this time and they have a different teacher. Um, true inclusion looks like when there's, you know, the special educator, the general educator, and they work together as a team and collaborate to serve all students. And it does take um, teachers that are willing to, to get creative and, and do that. And I, I think that, um, they find they will find that it's extremely beneficial to not just the students with the IEPs, but to other students as well who might learn differently or might learn, you know, in a learning style that is best for your child with Down syndrome. And then they're realizing that this other student is thriving now because he can do the activity be, because it was presented in a different way. Um, and so, you know, when you go through the IEP and you get to placement and least restrictive environment, you know, what the law states is that to the maximum extent appropriate, children with disabilities are educated with children who are not disabled in special classes, separate schools, or other removal from the regular education environment occurs only when the nature or severity of the disability is such that education in a regular class with the use of supplementary aids and services cannot be achieved satisfactorily. And a child with a disability cannot be removed from education in age appropriate regular classrooms solely because of needed modifications in the general education curriculum. And I'm gonna go into later on um, the difference between accommodation and modification as well, because um, that helps in the process of writing the IEP and kind of um, gauging, you know, how much of the general education curriculum and what aspects of it um, the student will participate in. And also um, the purpose of special education is to ensure that access um, to the general education curriculum so they can meet the educational standards um, within the jurisdiction of the public agency that applies to all children. Um, and so that's, you know, every state has their own set of standards and, and what they're, the ch what each student is expected to um, do completion upon graduation. Um, and so that is what that refers to. So some common misconceptions on uh, special education, I, my uh, buzz phrase that I always like to use is special education is a service, it's not a place. Um, I think a lot of schools sometimes um, envision special ed as a school or districts say, well, your child has Down syndrome, so they're going to go to the school down the street because that's where all the kids with Down syndrome go. Um, and that's not the case. Uh, special education should be brought to the child um, as a support, as a resource, as a service, and not considered to be that room 104 down the hall. Um, so some common myths and misconceptions about inclusion are that the child will need specifically designed instruction. For some things, perhaps, but other things, simple modifications and accommodations to the general education curriculum will work. Uh, the level and intensity of services needed would be too difficult in the gen ed setting. Um, you know, legally, schools cannot say that they don't have the, the finances or the staffing to provide an aid or an additional special education teacher. They can't say that to you in a meeting. Um, but oftentimes, this is one of the excuses that they will say is because of all of the extra work or extra body that needs to be in there, um, 
that it would be too difficult. Um, and we have, I've also heard and from my own district where they have tried to argue the point that being in, having a para is more restrictive than being in um, a special education classroom. So in that case, I don't think a para is necessarily being used properly um, because a para shouldn't be glued to, your, to the student um, and it's definitely not more restrictive than, than being around your, uh, more restrictive than being in a segregated classroom. Um, not on grade level, also not a reason to not be included. There are adapted books, there's other activities um, that a child could be um, involved in and that she, he or she will do better in a smaller setting. And I do think that there is a time and a place for small group and one-on-one -on -one instruction. Um, but when you look at the overall IEP and how many goals your child has, on average, it's about eight to 10 goals. I don't think that there should be like a IEP should never have more than X amount of goals because every kid is different. And then that doesn't mean they're individualized if we say every IEP can only have 10 goals. Um, and so when you think about how many goals you have, a goal to work on takes maybe 10 minutes. And so even if you're, you have 10 goals, you're not gonna work on every single goal every day or even for the whole year. When you look at that, you know, 100 minutes, how is that gonna be split up? And when can they work, you know, more directly on those specific goals um, in that smaller setting? And then what can be done to accommodate and modify the general education curriculum when you're in the larger general education classroom setting in the times that you're not working um, on your, your specific IEP goals, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so I hope this works. Um, this is a video I love because I think it really um, sh shows the difference of uh, what a modification is versus an accommodation. So hopefully it will work. Can you see it? I'll skip the end. Is it working? Yeah, Jessica, it is working. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> oh, Jane can't see it, she said. Lauren, can you see it? No. Oh. Hmm. Okay, let Maybe me I'm pause sure, it. Sure Sorry. Again. Yeah, well, I think what I'm going to do is I also pulled it up. I'm going to stop sharing and I pulled it up also on PDF. directly online. And so okay. I'm going to share that screen instead. So Not everyone can first see. time. <laughs> okay. The teacher thing you think on the fly, right? <laughs> Right. This, uh, it was virtual learning, sharing a screen. Okay, can everybody see this now if I hit play? Yes. Okay. Did you share awesome. your sound? I think so. Okay. Should be. Tell me if you can't hear it, though. Can you hear it? No, can't hear it. No? You can't hear it? No. <sighs> Well, it's really just music in the background, but <laughs> why can't I? Uh... So on the far right-hand side on where your Zoom controls, well, wherever you have your Zoom controls, it'll have a thing and it'll say, um, it'll say share sound. Do you see that? You have to go full screen, I believe. Yeah, so I have to stop sharing, I think. Yeah. Otherwise, I can't go to my full screen. Okay, sorry. Full so screen. over okay. um, see. audio settings? Yeah, audio settings. Mm -hmm. And then it should be audio. see audio, but I don't see anything that says share sound. Do you have anything on the bottom? Um, are your controls along the bottom? 
Yeah. Okay. So it should be to the far right hand side. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think, and it should just say share sound. Hmm. No, I have. Can you put it um, the link in the in the chat, and I can see if I can open it. Oh, that that would work. Thank you for your yeah absolutely. cooperation. Of course. Okay. Let's see. And yes, I will send a copy of the PowerPoint for sure. All right, let me bring it up here, see if I can bring it up and see if I can share my sound. Okay, let me see. Yeah, there's usually like a five second video that you have to skip, but then. You doodly, you drag, you drop, you tweak some settings, and boom, video done. It'll take you just a few minutes. So let's hear from the Doodly creator, Brad, to see why Doodly is so easy to use. Oh, that's. Wrap this offer mm -hmm. right now. Hi, I'm Brad Callen, and in this video, I'm going to show you how anyone can quickly and. Can you hear it? Yeah. Did it freeze? It didn't freeze on my end, but it probably did. Yeah, it got stuck. Um, Hmm. Got to the part where they were showing um, the, the accommodation. Um, they got through the modifications, but they were doing accommodations. Yeah, it didn't. Um, it didn't move to accommodations. It froze. Um, hmm. Well, I can go over it without watching the little video. <laughs> it's yeah, not going to work. They have the link in the. In the, yeah, in the chat. I just think it's it's yeah. a nice little visual. I'm a visual learner, and so rather than just having to listen to me the whole time. Um, but okay. But you, if the link is in there, if you want to watch it later, but we'll go. I'll start. I'll share my screen again. And um, oh, not that. Let's see. Okay. So accommodations and modifications. The big difference is an accommodation doesn't change the material that's being taught. The same material is being taught. It's just being taught in a way 
that the student can access. So an accommodation could be something like extended time on a test. Um, it could be um, uh, underlined notes, like it says here. Uh, so say um, a child or a student has fine motor difficulty. An accommodation could be that someone takes their notes for them or they're already given notes. That's not changing what they're learning. It's just accommodating to fit their disability and their need to make the curriculum accessible. If you have a reading disability, but you're taking a science test, the test can be read aloud to you because you're not testing reading ability or things like that. Um, preferential seating is another one. Um, basically, a lot of those things that are on a list in your IEP meeting um, that come to mind that just, so the main, main takeaway is it does not change the curriculum or change any of the material. It just affects the way the student is accessing the curriculum. Modifications, on the other hand, directly alter the material. So say you're taking a math test and there's 50 questions. Well, that's a lot, maybe 10 questions. So you're gonna take away, the teacher might take away half of those questions and a student might answer only five of them. Now, something like that could be considered a modification or an accommodation depending on um, you know, if, if a typical child is given a test and it's two problems assessing the same skill, but just to make, you know, help them take longer, practice it, and say your child does five problems and express the same skills, then perhaps they, they also get it. So math and the math problems are reducing um, the number of problems when it comes to math. I always say it can be a modification or an accommodation depending on the subject that's being taught and what the test is measuring. Um, for a different test, like say a science or a social studies test, certain questions are removed or there are questions that are about the subject. So they're still having access to that general education curriculum. But the questions might be um, less specific or it might be a fill in the blank when everyone else is having to write a paragraph or someone else has to, um, the general education students are asked to define a term, whereas a modification might be that the terms are there and the definitions are there and they just have to match. So it it really just alters it or you are not, um, you're giving it open notes for a test. That was one that I really um, found was a good example of a modification. So, you know, they're allowed to use open notes um, and they're modifying to make the curriculum, I don't wanna say easier, but more um, on the level of where the student with the IEP is currently. Um, and you can have modifications in one subject and accommodations in another. Um, accommodations in the IEP need to be, both of them, but they need to be consistent across subject areas. Um, in elementary school, it's usually not that hard be, given that most students have the same teacher. Um, but it also goes into um, related services. So the speech therapist, the occupational therapist, physical therapist, and um, uh, specials, whatever you call them in your district, uh, you know, reading or math, not reading and math, my goodness, art, music, PE. Um, sorry, it's been a long day. We got a puppy and I'm like on no sleep. Um, and so, um, you know, making sure that those um, teachers that work with your child um, also are familiar with, you know, they might not know the IEP ins and outs, but that at least if there are certain accommodations or modifications in their IEP that affect them when they're in that setting. Um, you know, I think of my son in art, he needs to have a special chair in art and he needs reduced pencil paper tasks and he needs things that are like already cut for him. Um, and so we need to make sure the art teacher is aware of that um, when he's in there or say your child has a behavior accommodation that says they can have a break every 10 minutes or something on a behavior plan that they use a token board. You wanna make sure 
or that those um, other teachers who might only see your child once or twice a week um, know those things. Um, the, your child's case manager should be sharing that with them, but I also like to follow up um, just to make sure um, and also just to kind of build that relationship with those teachers as well. Um, you know, they're just as much a part of, you know, his education as, as his other teachers. So some best practices for inclusion um, that I find work really well when we suggest them um, to other families or when we're talking to school districts um, and they're like, how do we do this? I don't know where to start. Um, one thing that, especially for upper elementary and you, for younger elementary school students as well, this can work, but peer tutoring or a peer buddy. Um, thinking of like, do you need to have your para next to you in the lunchroom because you can't sit still in your chair? Or do you pair two buddies on either side of your child and they know like, we're gonna keep, you know, we're gonna talk to you, we're gonna engage you, so you're gonna stay in your seat. Or you don't need to have a para just because you can't open your own lunch. You could have a friend perhaps that could open your lunch. Um, also for accessing some um, like reading or note taking, you, you pair the student with a peer buddy in their class um, or tr transitioning between classrooms with older students. You don't necessarily need to have that para walking, you know, the child from math to language arts. If there's a buddy that's in their same group going that way too, then you, you pair that way. Um, Cooperative learning, um, you know, that's really kind of like centers and stations where there's multiple teachers in the classroom. And, you know, a lot of teaching is done that way now. It has shown that that is best practices. You know, everybody's at different levels, IEP or not. Um, and so doing those group, smaller group activities in a rotation and then having, you know, that independent practice. And then some kids are doing like a small group and other kids might be um, working on their own or playing a game or having a break um, and really trying to focus on how all of the students can benefit from those smaller group activities within the general education classroom, not leaving. Um, tiered lessons and universal design for learning differentiated instruction are all basically intertwined is similar. I'm going to go into universal design for learning uh, next, but the universal design for learning is a great, great resource um, to help teachers with adapting and modifying um, curriculum to best suit the needs of all of the students in their classroom. Um, and, you know, the graphic below I also think is very important. Um, I think we often see the middle one and say, yeah, that's great. But what happens if you just took the wall down and everyone could see through it and you didn't have to stand on anything or go through any hurdles to, to access the same thing? It was there, it was just made easier so everyone could access it. Um, and so I think that sometimes teachers and school administrators need some of these suggestions. Um, you know, I advise a lot of families um, who are getting pushed back to offer suggestions or to say, well, can we try this? How about we send, you know, Bradley to science and you don't send the para and see if his buddy so-and-so can, can help keep, can help engage him in the, in the science experiment that we're doing. Um, kind of thing or you know offer resources on udl or differentiated instruction um, and there'll be books and links that will be at the end of the presentation that you'll have access to as well because there's a lot of stuff out there and you know sometimes it is hard to add one more thing to a teacher's plate asking them to like read or do things and so sometimes i find if i can um locate just little snippets of things or or say let's try this for now and see how it works or this has worked really well in the past let's see if we can try this and really keep that collaboration going between you and the IEP team 
and offering some of the knowledge that you know um, from being a part of the Down syndrome community and you know being an active participant in your child's education and being able to share with the team what you've learned. Um, and so universal design for learning is broken up into three different pieces. Um, the link for the CAST website that has all of the information on UDL, but it can be very overwhelming. It breaks each lesson down into three sections. Representation, so it's what are they learning? Action and expression, which is how you're learning. And engagement, the why of learning. So, excuse me, I just need to take a drink of water. So the what of learning is you're saying, all right, what am I teaching? It's gonna look at each lesson um, and see how I can represent what I'm teaching. Some kids are gonna need more than a PowerPoint. They might need a visual. Maybe the child can't read, so there needs to be some sort of symbol or um, also, or someone helping them interpret what is going on. But talk about what you're learning and how you're going to represent that in front of the classroom and make sure that it is in a variety of ways, not just because there might be a child with an IEP in the classroom, but because everyone has different learning styles and learns, you know, in various ways. And so it is beneficial to everyone in the classroom. And then action and expression. How are you going to learn? Not everyone is going to learn by sitting, lecturing, listening to a PowerPoint. So how can you show what you're learning? Can there be some physical activity? Can there be communication? Can there be some, you know, small group work or presentations or um, just mo providing multiple means of action to show what you know um, and how you're going to learn it? And it's a lot of teachers really do well in this aspect of it, I've found, um, because it almost, you can actually see what all of your students really know when they can express how they know something in their own way that is in their best learning style. Um, and so the next part is engagement, and that's huge. Like, why? Why are we learning this? What's the end goal? I want to hold interest of my students. I want them to put forth the effort and I want them to be successful. Um, and so teaching in a way that each student is actively engaged, but looking at their goals and including um, some like relating like their student, their background kind of, how can they relate to the lesson being taught? Is it personal? Are they invested in it? Is it something that they're interested in? So, you know, a non-preferred activity or a task, how can you make it relatable to the student so they might want to be engaged because they can say, oh, I know what that means or I can, I've done that before. Um, and really just trying to have the, the team get creative in how each child can express uh, their knowledge and how they can alter their teaching practices uh, to really, emphasize the different learning styles of everyone in their class. Um, so inclusive schooling um, is a website by um, Dr. Julie Costin, and I like to think of her as like the inclusion guru. She has written a number of books, which are on the next slide, um, about inclusive education, handbooks for principals, handbooks for paraprofessionals. She has She's spoken at a number of conferences, um, and she has um, now in COVID era, she has been doing a lot of um, virtual workshops and um, professional development for teachers. And there is there was a small one that was like four weeks long. I think it was only like $100 for paraprofessionals to get trained. And I actually shared it with my school and I said, you know, this is offered. I know teachers do professional development and the school 
has a certain amount of funds that are available to do that. And two of the paras at our school, not even in my son's class who work with him, they're in, a, in an autism program, but they took the class. Um, and so I think kind of just not saying I need you to take this, but taking some of the legwork out for the team to say, hey, like these are available if anyone's interested. Um, I have gifted our school um, an include one of um, Paula Kluth's books actually um, about inclusion. And I did it at his first IEP and I said, I just want to give this to you guys um, for your your library, it has some really great resources. And the teachers were like, this is great, thank you. Because there's so much information out there that if you can narrow it down a little bit, um, it helps them in the long run um, to say, okay, there's this little bit or even flag an article and say, hey, like this has been shown to work or I found this article really interesting. Um, and the UDL guidelines and all sorts of examples are there. Um, for legal issues um, or just more of understanding the law, not necessarily like legal issues, but what does IDEA say? What's the federal law say? I always refer people to rights law because that's where all of the great information is. Um, it's all laid out there. There are wonderful trainings from rights law. There are books available. Um, it used to be pretty hard to the trainings would travel, but now in COVID, they're offering them online. Um, and I don't believe they had ever done that before. So it's really making it accessible to everyone. Um, I've taken the courses and I think that they're extremely valuable um, in helping just navigate the process and understanding your rights and, your, um, and what IDEA says and what federal law regulates. And then there is a disability rights legal center, as well as you would, you would have a, a state um, due process area that you could contact if you were having problems. Um, so I listed some of the books of Julie and Paula. Um, and I just think that there, you know, there's a variety of them. I wouldn't suggest like here, read all of these books to you or to your team, but just, you know, depending on where your team is, where the school is on inclusion and where you feel like your child should have more inclusion or could benefit from more inclusion. Um, you know, a lot of these are very well researched and great tools to provide teachers and therapists and administrators. Um, to help with that. And, and linking back to um, the Universal Design for Learning page, they also give lots and lots of examples of specific topics that could be taught and how it could be broken down. So that is a really great tool for teachers because they don't have to reinvent the wheel um, necessarily. Um, okay, well, I finished with about 30 minutes for questions. Um, might not need that long, but I see there are some in the chat. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Oh, and I put my contact info there and um, just education at ndss.org goes to myself, our director Bart and um, our education program associate, Anna. Um, so, if you send it there, it, if you send it to either one, um, it'll get to us, but um, there's that and you will get the PowerPoint. And so you'll have all of that afterwards as well. So let me see. Well, thank you, Jessica. Um, I, did yeah. I just come off? I nope. I heard, maybe I, think, I thought I heard a little, a little voice, but <laughs> oh, thank you for coming, um, first of all. And uh, your information was very timely as we get ready for the next year. I know a lot of people are having their IEP meetings um, currently to get ready for the season. <laughs> a lot of them, a lot of them fall um, in the spring now because um, we had to shut schools down a year ago this spring, so they all had to have IEP yeah. meetings. So this is great information to have um, and to arm ourselves with um, to go in to ask for everything that we could um, for our our individuals. So thank you for being here. We did have a couple of Absolutely. questions um, in the yeah. chat and most of them were me, like ones that I know that people would ask. So um, 
if you want to address yeah. those and if anybody else has yeah, more questions, sure. we have a whole bunch of time yeah. here. So ask away. Yeah. So, okay. First question, um, how and when should a student be pulled for individual learning? How many minutes or is it individualized? Overall, yes, it should be individualized depending on the student need. But kind of what I said back to, you know, a goal really probably takes 10 minutes to hone in on and you probably don't need to work on the same goal one on one or in a small group every single day. Um, but I also recommend when, you know, let's be honest, a lot of schools aren't like, sure, I'm just going to throw your kid into all day in a gen ed classroom like that's hard to come by. And so to be realistic, um, one, when students are being pulled, I strongly recommend that it is pulled during um, like individual work time that the rest of the class is doing. Like for instance, in language arts, if they're doing a read aloud, if they're sharing, the child shouldn't be pulled out during that time. They can be pulled out when everyone's doing independent work or, um, that type of a thing, um, you know, and every student is different and every grade level is different. But but I do think that for those whole group activities, those are definitely times when a child preferably should not be pulled out. And um, as far as like when they're if they're if there's a time that they're supposed to be included, say for PE, you should never be pulled for a related service or um, a one-on-one -on -one or a small group resource um, lesson um, during a, a related um, an extra extracurricular specials activity, I should say, um, like art, music, PE, library. Like if that is in their IEP that they are to go there with their general education peers, if they're pulled for special ed during that time, um, then that actually makes the IEP out of compliance because they're not. Um, following through on all of the hours, um, if that makes sense. Um, let me see. Did that answer your question? Probably not, Donna. <laughs> um, okay, should we advocate for a pair to be trained and work with them multiple years? Um, I do think that pairs should have some sort of training. Um, and I think that there's pros and cons to having the same para for multiple years. I think that a lot of that is child student dependent. Um, on one side, I would say you might not want your child to only be able to work with one para because that para might not be there the next year on their own determination. Um, and so you'd want your child to be able to be flexible um, but in another turn, say your child has a really hard time transitioning and you come from COVID and then you're going back to school or there's a teacher he's he or she has never seen before and that's where their next grade level is going to be, then maybe you do advocate at least for that para to be a part of the team, a, a part of the the plan or um, is there to transition a new, new para um, depending on how the child reacts to new people. Um, and I do think that if they're, if the child is assigned a para and it's not working, I think that then a meeting should be called um, and to discuss, A, can there be someone else that is switched out? Or what can we do to provide more training to ensure that, you know, my child is supported in the way that they're supposed to be supported? Um, and how can we work together to do that? Because you know, no one wants to have advocated and have the support and it not to be done in the right way or to be done with a positive outcome and have a child come home from school every day, um, not happy because they didn't like who they were working with. Um, so I think it, it depends. I think there's definitely pros and cons. And I think it, sh it depends on the situation. Um, Let's see. Oh, here. So Jane said pros and cons. So she probably said the same thing I did. <laughs> um, yeah, that may, yeah, when the pair has to be gone. So when there's a substitute, um, yeah. Yeah, so there you go. I didn't scroll down that far to see that you guys had already answered that. Um, would you recommend teachers meet one another at the end of the year, current and future, and have a meeting as they transition? Yes. Um, whether it is at 
the end of the year or next school year. I know our schools, they don't make class choices necessarily until like the summer when they come back before school starts. But I think that in your IEP meeting in the year before, like, so say now you're having an IEP meeting, I would have it documented on that plot page or wherever the notes are all being combined that you request that, you know, within how many weeks of school or, you know, depending on when teacher contracts, they might not be able to do it right before or during teacher work days, but have a, a time set noted in the IEP that you expect the teachers to sit down and talk or that you want to call a meeting that second week of school with everyone and kind of get on board. Um, I always, because like we just wrote our goals last week, for example, there's six months from now until September um, when we start school again. And so a lot is going to change. And a lot of kids are just now going back to school. I don't know if you guys are back in school. Um, we have not been back in school. My son went back to school five weeks ago and my daughter two weeks ago. And he, she goes two days a week and he goes four days a week. And they're blown away by the progress that he's made in five weeks. So to write these goals, you know, I think everybody in these COVID times is going to run into that. And so one thing that I am recommending um, families to do is to write um on that page or have documented that you want to have a meeting um, by the end of the first quarter, um, if you do quarters in your school district, to kind of go over where, where everybody is, look at the data, do goals need to be changed, have they mastered some of the goals and you need to change and add new ones already because, you know, for this IEP to go through all of next year, basically, because when you get to April, that's basically a whole school year and you're making it six months ahead of time. Um, you know, a, a lot can change and a lot can happen between now and the end of this school year with those goals as well. So I, I would say at least to kind of give, give the team as far as like rewriting goals and amending an IEP, unless it's a true emergency, like kind of state like within the first, you know, nine weeks or in the first five weeks, however you think um, that first week and first two weeks of school is probably really busy for teachers, for everyone. Um, and to have everyone in a positive mindset, I would recommend just waiting a couple weeks into the, into the school year um, to try and have that meeting just so everybody can be there um, fresh and not stressed and um, overwhelmed with having to add another meeting. But I do think that um, noting in there that the past year teacher and the current teacher meet to discuss is, is very valuable, whether it's with you present or if it's just noted on there that they're expected, you know, that the administration will set time for them to be able to do that. Um, are your resources websites good for high school age student for inclusive education? Heard misconceptions. Yeah, I, I see you. I hear you, Jane. Um, that is a common Thing that we hear from our families often is elementary school is great and the second you get to middle and high school it gets challenging and so yes there are the resources that I've listed do touch on um, secondary education as far as middle and high school um, especially university or UDL universal design for learning um, and one other thing that um, I, I failed to mention was when you get into the upper grades, like middle and especially high school, um, when electives and things like that come out, um, we have found that a lot of families have are having problems with um, scheduling, saying, well, this is the time that they have to get resourced, so they can't do this elective. And that's been really frustrating, I think, for a lot of families, because if that's the one like part of the time that a child can be included um, and they're saying that they they can't make that work in the schedule. So um, we've been really trying to stress to families to discuss with the team, you know, that that vision statement, that goal, like what is the end goal? And sometimes that veers off the course of, you know, being 100% academic, like what is going to get your child to that end goal? What what place on this roadmap are you in right now to be able to get there? Um, 
I can look and pull. So we do have some more secondary resources that I did not um, put on the list, um, but I, I can um, send some more to you, but definitely Julie and Paula's um, books um, do touch on, on upper grades as well. Oh, that's a good idea to start a library. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know our school has a professional library. So when we gifted them the, the two books, um, they were appreciative of that. And I think just if your organization is able to provide that to a school district at a district level or for a resource center, um, that's really helpful to the to the teams. I totally agree with you and I and I I will definitely get that um, request to our board. Um, I know they had talked about it one other time, the logistics of who checks it out and when is it checked out and how long is it checked out and who makes sure it gets back. All of those things are things I think that they're still considering, but um, mm -hmm. definitely would love to do that. We actually do have, we had a project last year that was um, blind date with a book. And so we sent out some mm -hmm. materials um, and some of them were returned after they were, they were done. And so we um, have some materials already started. It's just kind of getting those those bugs worked out. We just hired our, our first executive director this year. So hopefully she's right. on it. I'm, I'm sure she's got it on her long list of things to do. But yeah. Um, well, Jessica, yeah. thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions for Jessica before we let her go? And our contact information is there um, if you need it. Um, and your website was there also. Um, yes, and I will send you the PowerPoint. So if you want to share that as well, um, you're welcome yes, to we'll be, mm -hmm. put it on our website so that any as as, as well as the um, the recording here tonight. Yes, I know. I know, Ruby. Yes, I know. Um, so that everybody can access that um, at their leisure again, if, the, if it comes up again. So wanted mm -hmm. to thank you for being here. And thank you guys, Jane sure. and Lauren um, and Sheila for being here and um, spread the word education series every third Tuesday. We're going to delve into the IEP this year, look at the different components of it and um, talk about what's required to be in there. What's good practice to be in there. And what are some really good things that some good teachers have put in there and give you some great examples to go by. So that is what's coming up this year. So help us spread the word and um, Jessica, thank you so much. And um, we'll continue to support NDSS. You guys are fantastic. I love your resources. Um, and we're, we're very proud to be associated with you guys. So thank you for being thank here. Thank you. Today. Thank you. All right. Thanks, sure. Guys. No, it was great. And feel free to send a message if you have any questions or anything afterwards. Um, but I hope everybody has a great night. We sure will. Thank you. Good night, guys. Bye-bye. Okay.